morning, Hill City. We're so glad you have joined us today, whether you are sitting in your car or watching from your living room. Hopefully you have your coffee and are ready to dive into the Sermon on the Mount. But before we get there, we have an announcement. We would love for you to join us this Easter. We are so happy we can have an in-person service this Easter. And we're actually gonna have two services, one at 9.30 and one at 11.30. We'll drop the link in the comments, but you can register for that today. And we want you to invite your friends, invite family, invite neighbors who might not have somewhere to go this Easter. We're excited that we're doing something a little different. We're going to be portraying the story of Jesus through artwork and scripture reading and interactive um, work with lights. So if that doesn't get you to sign up, I don't know what will. It should be a great time. Also, we have a countdown question this morning. So our countdown question is, due to our snowstorm we had this last week, what is your favorite snow day activity? For me, I think when it's actually snowing and the wind is blowing, I just like sitting inside where it's warm and watching the snow. I don't like having to go out into it. But when it's kind of stopped and there's snow piles out there, if there's kids around, I love to go sledding. So that is my answer. What is yours?
Thank you for joining in online. Uh, we are on episode 10, that's right, 10 of the series Flip the Script, moving through verse by verse on the Sermon on the Mount and listening to teacher Jesus showing us this new way of being human and human like Jesus. And, and what's, this, what's going on is Jesus is giving us a totally different kind of script to our life to our meaning, to our purpose, and to our destination. And my goal for you is that you would not only hear Jesus, but you would begin to practice the life of Jesus. That is my goal. Because we, we know a lot of stuff, we hear a lot of stuff, but can we actually walk in the ways of Jesus? That's the calling of the Christian. And the way he lives, treated people, the way he gave, the way he loved, poured out, brought close and the way he endured hardship with his faith. Because you are his disciples, I am his disciple, and we are followers, apprentices, practitioners. And, and, and I love to say it in this way, because it makes more sense for me. We are in Jesus' training so that we could be like him today, think like him, love like him, be generous like him, live like him, and that, and live out the script that he has given us. Uh, much of our goals today, if, if you would walk around in culture, I would think revolves around my best life now. Like built around this understanding of more and consumption, built around my dreams, having it all, experiencing it all, like hashtag winning, like hashtag blessed, all about my happiness, as if we really understand even our happiness. Yet, yet the teachings of Jesus is antithetical to the, our way of culture because Jesus starts by teaching us to lose, to deny ourselves, to love my enemy, to forgive boldly. This hard work of peacemaking, it's not peace faking, peace making, to live simply and to die to self, to carry our cross. Yet this is especially hard for the modern Western, hyperactive, consumption-driven, hustle American Christian or believer or just spiritualist, I don't know, where we're looking for something more, right? We try to walk this line between these two worlds and we come out frustrated in both. Yet this invitation is open to anyone who is willing to take Jesus up on his offer. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find real life, full life. I guess today we face this very matrix, Morpheus, Neo moment, a moment of decision. And you could take the blue pill and Morpheus says, and you'll wake up tomorrow in bed and continue to live life as usual. Or we can take the red pill and take Jesus up on his offer and go all in and go down this, uh, they call it the rabbit hole, but go down this way of real life. And he will show you the life in the kingdom of God for all it's worth. And with all that in mind, I know that's a lot already. Let's dive into our scripture today. Matthew 7, 1 to 7. He says this, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to good, uh, good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So, in everything, do to others what you, have, uh, you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Amen. Jesus is like, 
like those good pastors that are trying to close up their Sermon of the Mount, right? But like any good preacher, you know, when they say we're coming to a close, you know he got a lot more points behind. He got some preach left in him. And in Matthew's letter, so far we've learned that God's kingdom is here and Jesus is the door, the entrance to all of it. And so we're knocking, right? And there's this cost to following Jesus, an actual way of following. And, and it will mean that your life is going to have to change. You can't follow Jesus and say, I'm not going anywhere. You know what I mean? I can't follow Jesus and expect no change and stay the same. Or we're not really following. Rather, we're asking Jesus, can you follow us? Can you follow me for a, a little bit? which leads to a fragile faith built around how we feel in the moment. And so when we're feeling good, life is good, God is good, and things are good. And when we're bad and, and things are hard, what's going on in life? We have this fragile faith, and I understand the ups and downs of, of life, but many people today in our society are going through this existential crisis, facing, like just facing life with happiness and meaning and joy. And, and I, I wanna say this, I don't, I don't actually know how to say this softly, but our youth group maturity in faith is not enough for the challenges of life that we are going to face. That's why Jesus calls us into training, not just information, but into practice. And he also looks not only on the outside, but our heart and intention training us on the Beatitudes, which crumples our modern view of the good life. Training in prayer, in view of our relationship to God, we come before him and say, our Father in heaven as God's kids and co-workers with Jesus. Training in self-awareness, digging down deep to our hidden motives, not only for the bad things we do, for even the good things we do. Why we give, why we pray, why we fast, and even judge. In reference to all this, now how do we come before God? Verse 7, we ask and it will be given to you. We seek and you will find. We knock and the door will be open to you. So this asking, seeking, knocking is not this blank check like this lotto win. Rather, we knowingly leave room for God's desire to override ours because he already told us his kingdom come. His will be done. Such prayers assume submission to God. It assumes that our goals align with His goals. And we're not trying to trade with God or fake God out with outward religion or of this false humility. Remember, Jesus has already unwrapped that, our pretense, with His teachings beforehand. Once, and, and once that's confronted in us, we ask, we seek, we knock. And then verse 8, for everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door is open. Which of you, think about this, which of you, all of you, if your son asks for bread, if your daughter asks for food, would give them a stone, right? Or if they asked for a fish, you would give them a snake. You would give them the opposite of what they needed. If you then, though you are evil, I think that's very, very funny. He's like, you are evil. Let me just tell you straight. You have selfish motives. If you then are who are evil, know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more? How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? Access. Say the word access. I hope you say it. You might not say it, but I, I'm saying it. Access, right? Verse 8 is all about access. How, how many of you guys work for a place with cool access cards? I used to work for this tech place, and we had these cool access cards and my face on it, yeah? And these cards, that if you, you didn't have them, you are locked out of the building. You cannot get in, no matter how hard you try. Now, have you ever been somewhere thinking about access or to a place or a part of something where you know you could not have gotten in yourself. You, can, you couldn't have went to that vacation or you couldn't have been to that place or experienced what you experienced yourself. I mean, you shouldn't have been there, but someone got you in. Well, this is my story. How many of you guys know the fray? And, uh, and that kind of ages me, I apologize. Fray is this old, older Colorado emo band uh, and if you guys watch Grey's Anatomy, that's how they got popular uh, on their song, How to Save a Life. Well, during that time, I had a friend named Josh and Michelle 
Sosa, shout out, right? <laughs> which were friends of mine. And, and they were also friends of the band, which was excellent, right? And on one fate-filled night, after some begging by me, maybe, right? I was invited and given VIP passes to the Red Rocks Amphitheater for their sold out concert. Praise the Lord, right? I mean, we rolled up to the Red Rocks, bypassing the lines of cars and the lines of people, and we parked right next to the venue in VIP parking. That's just how I roll, right? We were next to the tour bus and they took us to these back elevators, which took us back down on in backstage, right? And, and then we went through these tunnels, ending up in the sound booth right in front of the stage where I comfortably watched the concert with some, with some executives and I was drinking, eating off the food platter, drinking drinks, and I was covered from the element. I was like, afterwards, I got to chill with the band. And did I mention I was backstage at the Red Rocks? It was amazing. I saw all the pictures of the people that performed there beforehand. And it was this really surreal experience and all this access was because of my relationship with Josh and Michelle and some begging, right? I could not have made this happen on my own. It was their access that got me in. So Jesus is reminding his disciples in training, you, sir, you, ma'am, have access to the Father. Not because of your goodness, not because of your work, not because you're so awesome. No, you're evil. That's what he says. But Jesus is awesome. His life, his sacrifice, his work to bring you back to God, to bridge, to restore, to reconcile to you, to your creation relationship, garden relationship to your Father in heaven who is holy. Amen. Now, now listen to this. When your kids ask, you to do something like it when they ask to do something good what do you say you're like yeah of course mom can i clean my room like of course you say yes dad can you help me with my homework yes can i go serve the homeless can, can i shovel the neighbor's driveway after the snow yes and yes when my kids ask for something good i love to give it to them don't you now how much more think about it those though your father in heaven give you good gifts to those who ask god is excited to give good gifts think about that so asking seeking and knocking is more than just getting what we want or need it is a continual relationship connection depth that is forming us into Christ's likeness. This asking is building this relationship, right? And this is so good. I hope it's hitting you like it's hitting me. My distant mentor, and I tell you about him, Tim Keller says it this way. Prayer is how God gives us so many of the unimaginable things he has for us. Indeed, prayer makes it safe for God to give us many of the things we desire most. It is the way we know God, the way we finally treat God as God. Prayer is simply the key to everything we need to do and to be in life. Amen. Prayer is knowing God, spending time with God, waiting on God, learning from God, asking God, trusting God, growing with God. Verse 12, so that in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law of the prophets. This deep relationship with God brings us confidence that we can trust God and treat people well, not because of how they treated us, but because of how God has treated us and our heart has been changing, leading us to a life of Jesus, that his kingdom come, his will be done in my life as it is in heaven, in our church as it is in heaven, in our city as it is in heaven, in our schools, our homes as it is in heaven, in our businesses as it is in heaven. So I have a couple points for you. Number one, we are God's kingdom come. You are part of it. 
you are called by God. You are the tangible kingdom of God's goodness and grace. You are the smile of God, the hands of God, the generosity of God, the comfort of God. You are the feet that brings good news. We learned that in house church, right? You are the mouth and encouragement of God. You are the heart that it has is full of care and tenderness of God. As light and salt of the world, we go into dark places to bring the hope of God. Amen. Number two, we are disciple makers. You are a disciple maker. You're like, not me. No, no, no. You are a disciple maker on a mission with Jesus to make disciples of all people, teaching them to obey everything that Christ has commanded us. My faith life has to be bigger than me. My faith life, your faith life has to be bigger than me. I and you are called to others to see the world from God's eyes, not just to sit back and let professional Christians do the work of ministry. No, no, no. We are co-workers with Jesus, asking and seeking and knocking. See, when we're not co-working with Jesus, we don't need to do much asking, seeking, and knocking. But when we're working with Jesus, we're like, God, you put me into this situation, I ask you. Or God, I need to really seek this out so how I can figure out how to disciple, how to help. Or knocking, God, help us right now. And, and, and it makes full sense. If our faith is not active, and if it's not bigger than me, is your, is your faith stagnant? Do you need to know the depths and power of God? Then I want you to ask, uh, just pray a simple prayer. God, use me. And then do something about it. Disciple someone. Lead someone. And as we begin to give our lives to others, because we're seeing our life from the point of view of God, and, uh, and others begin to depend on us, lean on us, we begin to grow in new depths and heights in Christ. You know, uh, when you're a, not a parent, you can give a lot of parental advice, but you don't really understand it. That you don't really understand the growth of what being a parent does. But when you become a parent and you understand, I really don't know much, and you start working this thing out, leading someone else, loving someone else, growing someone else, there is a part of your life that really grows. I really believe that all Christians need to be disciples and disciple makers. And there is a part of your life that will grow as you disciple and lead others as they lean on you, as you lean on Christ. And you might want them to lean on Christ too. And you can't do it on your own. You will need the wisdom of God, the power of God, and some lessons are only found on the other side of discipleship. They are. Number three, we are all pastors. We are all in full-time ministry. I don't care if you're a truck driver or a doctor or a construction worker or a teacher, you are called to pastor the people around you. But what if, what, what if we, like, what if we viewed our coworkers as our congregation? What if, what if you became their pastor at work? And, and what if you are the only moment, the only Jesus they will ever experience? Our workplace, after all, is where we spend the majority of our time. But far too few of us view ourselves as God does. I think we need a major paradigm shift. I happen to pastor a church, but I think some of the greatest pastors aren't even viewed as pastors. They're accountants, engineers, re receptionists, cashiers. They work for Geek Squad at Best Buy. They love Jesus with all their hearts and they understand that God has called them to the people around them. In their lunchrooms, construction zones, classrooms, coffee shop become holy places. And number four, this is it, coming to an end. I'm not faking you this time. We are access cards. One of the most powerful things we can do is give people access in a simple way. This is the gospel too. This is the good news for people too. Access to connections when people have relational poverty, right? To jobs, to fellowship, to adventures. Access to thoughts and ideas. Access to relationships, to fathering and mothering. You have access to know that other people do not have access to. And, and what you might consider small is great to those who don't have access. Our life, 
our businesses, our advantages, our training, our things, our cars, our homes, our relationships were not meant for us alone. They are good gifts that God has given us so that we could treat and love others as we want to be treated. Finally, our greatest access is our access to Jesus, showing others to come along, to, to train with you, to know God with you. We all bring this particular perspective and insight that we together can bring a more full and holistic picture and discernment of God. And this we can only experience together. That is the church. That is the church active. That is the church of the kingdom of God. So keep asking in prayer. Keep seeking with intensity and sincerity. Keep knocking with persistence because it drives us to the Lord again and again. Don't be discouraged. Even if the answer is delayed, God really uh, does care for you. Make your request known to God who gives good gifts. God will either give us what we ask or give us what we would have asked if we knew everything he knows. We could trust him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray we ask and we seek and we knock, Lord God. We ask in prayer, Lord God, in relationship. We seek with sincerity, Lord God, and we keep knocking with persistence, Lord, because we are co-workers with you. I pray in this message, Lord God, that it all comes down to seeing our world the way you see it and treating people the way we want to be treated, fulfilling the law and, of, uh, and the prophets, Lord, becoming and training like Christ. I pray that your church, Lord, would be, Lord, your church, the way you see it, Lord. Change our perspective, and I pray that we would take risk and we would take a step of faith and put confidence in you, in the way you see our world. Let us take that red pill, jump in to the deep end of what it means to be a disciple, a follower, an apprentice, Lord God, an imitator of Christ. Lord, strengthen your people, Lord God. And I pray, Lord, they will see heaven, Lord. They will see your kingdom come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.